staring at me with those black eyes. Well, that's uh, what Caroline Godfrey used to say to me. We were both elected in 1992 to the Cochrane Town Council. And the reason we were elected was to stop a road from going through in this exact location here, filling in this ravine and two others west of here. The road was uh, intended to service Glen Eagle's development. And both Caroline and I were representing in the East End when we were elected to stop this road. And I kept thinking to myself, when is she ever going to say anything? When is she going to do anything? We didn't bring her back here on council to do nothing. She'd been mayor of Carkin for 20 years, and I'd heard all these great things about Caroline Godfrey. Even my husband voted for Caroline Godfrey because she was supposed to be our savior. And there she was, sitting across from me, this little old woman like Yoda, doing nothing. She didn't know why I was staring at her, but I was actually staring at her because that's how I hurt. I come from a family of 11 kids. We grew up in Quebec on a farm. When we were young, we, um, we just had lots of good food and lots of exercise, so we were relatively healthy. But if we got sick, we just got better. And the reason was we had no money. So I had mumps, chicken pox, measles, just about every childhood disease you could get in a period of about six months. And I can remember sitting in a big chair by the old wood stove and night after night and my father would stay up and stoke the fire to keep me warm and the pain was so awful. It was worse, far worse than childbirth and it's just, I couldn't get away from it. So by the time I was seven, I guess the scar tissue from all that, um, I was completely deaf in this ear and profoundly deaf in the other. But I didn't know I was deaf. Um, I guess my brain just took over and hurt for me. A good example, when I was 21, I moved out here to Alberta with my husband. And uh, we were sharing a house with five other medical students. And there was one medical student in particular, Ian. And we didn't get along that well. And Ian had this terrible habit of reading a newspaper, He'd flip it open with these huge, grandiose uh, movements. I'd say, Ian, do you have to read the newspaper so loud? And then walk away. And I technically couldn't hear that paper at all. What I was hearing was the movement and, and all the action around him. And my brain was telling me there's a noise. One day my husband said, you're as deaf as a doornail. You better go get a hearing aid. And there was a practitioner about five blocks, well, four or five blocks, right on the corner of 17th Avenue and 4th Street in uh, Calgary. And so I went there and of course, within hours they fitted me with a hearing aid. And he showed me my graph showing like normal is here and my hearing was way down there. And he said, you know, you're quite amazing that you can hear it all. Um, if you were to apply for Canada Pension Plan, you'd be considered profoundly deaf. You'd never have to work a day in your life. And I just kept looking at him wondering, what is he? this is craziness? You know, I can hear everything you're saying. Well, he put the hearing aid on and said, Judy, if you take this off and don't give it a chance, you'll never wear a hearing aid and you'll never learn to hear. You have to promise me that you'll wear it for three days solid and you won't take it off except maybe at night when you're sleeping because you, it'll be uncomfortable. So I made the promise, if anyone knows me, if I make a commitment, that's it, you know, it's stuck. So I made a promise I wouldn't take it off for three days. And then I left his office and went down the stairs and it was the first time I'd ever heard my footsteps. And when I opened the doors onto 4th Avenue, it was right close to 17th Avenue, I sprung the doors open like that. All the sound came in at once. The sound of the cars passing, and uh, screeching tires, people talking, and it was all coming in and my brain was on massive overload. I was so afraid. It was the hugest panic I've ever had in my life. I don't know if you can imagine how scary that was. And 
I had to walk four blocks trying to figure out where all the noise was coming from. And it was so scary because I turned around and felt like a car was going to run over me and trying to place where the people were and all these voices. And when I got back to that house, as I walked in the door, there was Ian sitting there with his newspaper. And of course he flipped it open and I stopped where I was and I started to cry. And I don't think I've ever cried like that ever, ever before or ever again in my life. And he put down his newspaper. Um, the first time he ever really paid attention to me, I think. And he walked up behind and turned down my hearing aid. He said, what I want you to do is just listen to me talk. And when all you can hear is the sound of my voice, then I want you to go upstairs and lay down on the bed and try and figure out where the sounds are coming from in the house. And then he started to talk. He actually had the most beautiful tenor voice I've ever heard. And the sound and the cadence and how he put words together. And pretty soon that's all I could hear was his voice. And you have to understand, like I really hated this guy. And there I was just listening to him and his beautiful tenor. And then pretty soon, that was it. Uh, I felt comfortable, I'd stopped crying. I went upstairs and lay on the bed. And this big old fat cat that lived in the house with us, she just knew that I needed comfort, I guess, and she lay on me. And in the past, I would pet her, and I could hear her purr through my hand. But I'd actually never heard the sound. And the first time, there I was laying with this big fat cat, and she was all curled up, and I was patting her, and I could hear the purring. It was a beautiful sound. And it was, I was just overwhelmed that I could see the cat, feel the cat, hear the cat. And Caroline wouldn't have known any of that. She wouldn't have known that in order to hear what she had to say, I had to stare at her. And a lot of people thought I stare at them, but I don't. I'm just watching them. I'm watching how they move their body watching what they do and I was watching and I was watching and watching Caroline Godfrey sit across from me she never was doing a damn thing and I couldn't hear her I couldn't see what she was doing and I guess I said that a couple of times I say you know what are you doing you stupid old woman like we elected you to get something done around here so show us some leadership here let's get out there and get something done and one day well she called me you little shit that was her word for me you little shit one day she said, come with me, you little shit. And I didn't know where she was taking me or what we were going to do. Um, certainly I'd walk these hillsides every day that I can recall if that, in that time with my kids. And in those days, I was probably in the best physical shape I'd ever been. I was a long distance runner and um, did these cycle runs um, up and through the Kananaskis all over this area. And Caroline was 70 years old and we started here, followed that path up behind those fence lines and up the hill and at that time the highest point of land was much higher than what you can see here. That whole area has been leveled for the Glen Eulis development. And so the whole time we were going up the hill I was asking her questions and saying, you know Caroline, we were depending on you to get something done around here. Look at this mess. You know, it's always going to be like this. It's going to be totally destroyed. We don't have a lot of time. And finally we stopped and she said, now turn around and look. And I went, Caroline, how did you just do that? She wasn't out of breath. She just walked up a 15% grade, keeping pace with me. And it was just phenomenal. And she said, just tell me what you see. So I looked down and right out here by the Bow River at the time was the sewage treatment plant. I said, well, this is a sewage treatment plant. What are you doing? And she said, how do you think that happened? Well, somebody built it. No, she said, I built it. I got the money. I made sure it happened. I got the sewage treatment plant built. Now look out and what else do you see? And by the time we were talking about things in the western part of Cochrane, I was asking her questions and she was telling me stories of her and her husband and how they'd moved here. She'd gotten involved in politics and how she'd grown up in the war, how this was her life. This was her passion. This town, Cochrane, Alberta. 
she lived and breathed for this. And coming down that hill that day, we came to this exact spot. She got in her little blue car, and I got in my car, and then she drove away like a bat out of hell. And I always listened to Caroline from that point on. Uh, I listened to her with my eyes and with my ears, and with my whole being, because she had something important not just to tell me, but to tell this whole community. And uh, I will never forget Caroline Godfrey. There was one time I didn't listen to Caroline, it was just before she died. But that's another story. Thank you.